Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the House of the Deaf podcast. It's been a while. We've got Raf Calantone from Austin, Texas, as usual. Hi, Raf. Hello. And uh, guess what? We've got another special guest. Um, this is Julia Chernenko from Alcat Games, the lead game designer on Pathfinder Kingmaker, which came out in 2018. No, I, at that time I was a junior game designer. Currently. Junior game designer, so okay. It was a quick grow. Yeah, and uh, the Wrath of the Righteous, which came out this fall. Yep. Yeah, brilliant RPGs. So thank you for joining us and let's roll. You are entering the house of the dead. So obviously we're going to talk about game design in modern role-playing games. Uh, despite the fact that both Pathfinder games are isometric RPGs, which uh, can be considered by many players uh, old-school style, um, you know, the, the, the revolution in modern RPGs uh, began somewhere uh, in 2014, uh, when Pillars of Eternity came, Wasteland 2, Divinity Original Sin, and uh, they were called by many, by critics, by gamers, old school RPGs. But uh, right now, with games like uh, Pathfinder and uh, Divinity Original Sin 2, and Pillars of Eternity 2, and uh, Wasteland 3, and the upcoming Baldur's Gate 3, of course, uh, we can relate to them as full scale modern role playing games. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, is there a line? Where do you see that line be uh, between the uh, you know old style RPGs, which are you know back then they were based on uh, nostalgic feelings of the audience uh, and modern day classics, maybe? Uh, well, actually, that's a tricky point because I can't consider like Pathfinder games or Pillars of Eternity two uh, as a modern uh, CRPGs because. For me, they are still kind of uh, old style. Because when you create a CRPG today, especially based uh, on, I don't know, uh, real time or with pause uh, combat system, you still have this old CRPG in your head. And you try to kind of, you have this a little bit of nostalgia, what you liked in that game. And then you try to bring small bits that made you fall in love, um, I don't know, many years ago in uh, this uh, genre. So it's kind of, I think it's modern in terms of uh, it allows you to do a little bit better in terms of quality of life. Very console friendly. Yes, console friendly, friendly year, some games, uh, some games are indeed very console friendly. So it allows you to be a little bit more modern, but at the same time, at heart of uh, most of the CRPG games, it's still this old nostalgia of the, I don't know, childhood dreams and love. So I can't say that I would call all of them modern CRPGs. Well, yeah. which, one, uh, which ones are modern, which ones are less modern, in your opinion? Uh, maybe Baldur's Gate, for instance, 3 will be a little bit modern, but partially just because they base uh, their game on D&D uh, 5th edition. So 5th edition is already a modernized version of all D&Ds. And if you compare with Baldur's Gate initially, so there is a change on the board, let's say in the board version of the game. So obviously there will be a change in uh, the computer version of it. So maybe uh, also probably Divinity Original Sin uh, two and even maybe one uh, they are a little bit modern so they kind of took a little bit different um approach to how you do a crpg game so to some degree yeah I, I would probably call them a little bit more modern but i don't know maybe it's just because i really loved baldur's gate uh icewind dale all that old games for me most of the crpg games are still kind of nostalgic old based yeah, but uh, they are pretty successful, I yeah. mean, the, in the commercial terms. Well, it doesn't, like, if it is something that is, I don't know, have this nost nostalgia filter, it doesn't mean that it won't be successful, because... I mean, you cannot so just uh, rely on the older gamers. No, 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 you, obviously you can't, because uh, there is always a new 
people, newcomers. So, for instance, in Pathfinder of Wrath of the Righteous, or even in Kingmaker, we actually had this problem that uh, the game itself, the mechanics of that game are very, well, kind of hardcore. And then we also wanted to give uh, different players a lot of opportunities, how they can build their character, how they can roleplay that character. So the challenge was uh, for the newcomers, like, how can you explain that deep system for a person who doesn't know anything, like, who didn't play Pathfinder, D&D, uh, none All of... Table stop crazy stuff. Even like Baldur's Gate mm -hmm. or Icewind Dale's uh, old games, like, if you haven't played them, how do you learn how to teach uh, a person to play? So that was a challenge. I think we kind of improved in, uh, in Pathfinder of Wrath of the Righteous, so we did a lot of like different quality of life yeah, improvements just, yeah. just to make it easier, but there are still a lot of things to kind of make more uh, user-friendly, I would say. So, yeah. yeah, RPGs are... It's a fascinating topic because I think no one is really very in agreement about what they are, True. what constitutes an RPG, right? Uh, and I mean, I think for a good reason is that they all started with pen and paper kind of thing. And uh, the possibilities in a pen and paper game are just uh, so infinite that we nobody ever could reproduce that, you know, in a, in a, in a computer game format. However, we uh, computer game format for RPGs, it went somewhere else. I guess that's why we call them uh, CRPGs. Um, but then nobody really owns the, the authority to say what is an RPG, what's not, even though there are always those wars, right? Like, does it have dialogue? Can I explore? Is it like, are the, you know, <laughs> all, the uh, time. Is, yeah. all the time, right? Like, how many items do you have or whatever are the things? And um, at the end of the day, and I'm, myself, I, I make RPGs, but I'm not even sure what I make are really RPGs. Like my, my first, I guess, game that was definitely in the RPG field was Arx Fatalis. And now I guess I'm doing Weird West, which you know, I assume is going to go into the RPG as well. But mine are always a little, like what matters to me as an RPG might not be what matters to others as an RPG, right? And so at the end of the day, I think it's really, uh, that, this is my question to you. Uh, what, what were, if maybe not even were, but what was the game uh, that, you know, what, the, what was the RPG that you were playing when you were say 15? Because I have this theory that Whatever we, we, we played, whatever we loved at, at around 14, 15, 16 is going gonna, is gonna to forge our uh, taste forever. Uh, and as artists, as people who make things now, it, you're probably somehow inspired by something that you were playing when you were 15. Uh, true, true. For me, it was actually Neverwinter Nights' first one. So I uh, started my the whole journey with RPGs with uh, Neverwinter Nights' first one. Then I played Neverwinter Nights' second one, and only then I actually played Baldur's Gate. So the thing that opened this gate to the infinite possibilities to this creativity was uh, Never Went to Nights 1 and I just I fell in love with that because first of all what I really loved about the game is that I can create whoever I want like mm -hmm. I want to be an elf I want to be a half orc doesn't matter like and then you can choose a, a class and then there is a story and it was very fascinating with me uh, for me so but when I started playing it the mechanics I just like I have no idea like oh okay let it be strengths maybe I'm going to be charismatic so let it be charisma but I'm going to go with a wizard uh, and whose casting start is obviously not charisma so just like it was a total mess but I still loved it oh sorry no problem. <laughs> and somehow I managed to finish that game so yeah for me it was Never Winter Nights and for you Raf. Oh, for me, it was uh, undoubtedly uh, Ultima uh -huh. 7 or 6, 6 or 7, and uh, for It's sure always Ultima, Ultima for guys <laughs> like Raf. It's always <laughs> Ultima. Whoever you ask, yeah. like, you go, you can go with Ken Levin or Sven Winke, it's always Ultima. <laughs> yeah, I come from simulation, basically, mm -hmm. uh, because to me, to me, the thing that blew my mind uh, and was like a turning point for me in terms of how passionate I felt and obsessed I felt with virtual world was when I, I realized that I could move items around, 
even useless objects and that nothing was abstracted and that somehow I could impact the world with my actions uh, beyond what the liberal designers or the designers in general wanted me to do. You know, it was beyond the, the, the written quest and the offered part. It was just that if I was, you know, shutting, switching off some some uh, some shutters in a, in a house, like shutting down, sorry, uh, some, some shutters, then a few minutes later, a character would come by and reopen them. <laughs> and I found, oh my God, this is like, I can use that somehow, probably, you know. In a, in a situation where I wanna I wanna attract that NPC away from somewhere, for example, so that I can come back, you know. And that that to me was um, like yeah, very very life changing in a way. So it's the question of the uh, scale of freedom that yeah. you get from the game. And uh, well, uh, Ultima was uh, you know uh, games like the Divinity Original Sin and uh, you know previous Divinity games they were heavily influenced by Ultima. Their creators are fans of Ultima, as I said. And uh, is it possible to combine this uh, basic human logic, uh, which was which Ultima was praised for, uh, with this heavy? Uh, system like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder that you worked with? Well, I would say everything is possible. It depends on how much time and basically money you have. And uh, um, so I would say yes, but obviously the, uh, then uh, you start to think like how can you can do it. So uh, in uh, D&D and Pathfinder, you usually rely a lot on the stats of mm -hmm. your character, like abilities. Instructions, yeah. Yeah, like abilities for almost anything you want to do, you have to do a skill check. So, uh, you, for instance, you have stealth, uh, and then basically your whole stealth will be based on your uh, skill check or skill of stealth, so the perception of uh, the enemy, all, all interactions like climbing, uh, maybe even pickpocketing, persuasion, it's all based on skills. So the, I think, tricky part would be where you draw the line for like which actions will require checks, some kind of checks, and which actions will actually uh, require players' decision, players, I don't know, skills, like uh, I want to open uh, this window. How do you, how can I do it stealthy? So in many games like D and D, it would be that uh, you'll roll your stealth. If you were successful, you're still doing it stealthy, like opening the window. Perfect. Uh, in uh, simulations, it's more like you have to, I don't know, hide, uh, the NPC is walking, so you have to uh, move around uh, this NPC and then open the um, window, so it will depend on the player. And yeah, everything is possible, but uh, it, it will be tricky. And the trickiest part is actually not to uh, decide which action will requ require player, which action will uh, requ oops, sorry, no I'm moving my hands too much. Uh, <laughs> player um, ch um, characters checks. It will be how do you explain the player when it is his decision and his skills and when it is his character skills so this is a tricky part i would say but at the same time there's the you know the, the question of uh, dungeon master in a tabletop game true uh, but when it comes to a crpg adaptation uh, who takes the place of the dungeon master? I mean, is it just the difficulty level when you can communicate with the master? I mean, this battle is too hard. We just want to continue playing. You don't want to torture us. We want to, you know, have fun. Uh, and uh, but what about the, the those skill checks and uh, stuff? Uh, that's a good question. So. In uh, CRPGs, you don't actually have uh, dungeon masters, so you have de game designers, narrative designers, level designers, who are trying to build the whole system that you can play as if you were playing with dungeon master. Mm -hmm. So many things are set in stone. You kind of have to create a rule set. Like this is going to be skill checks. This is going to be I don't know your players' abilities. I don't know decisions and so on and so forth. But as you mentioned with uh, battles, actually, uh, it is. Very 
very difficult because, uh, as I said, a lot of newcomers and some of them are familiar with the system, some of them not, some kind of in, fall in between. So in our game, we actually have a lot of difficulty settings and we usually fight uh, within uh, our team like, okay, we have to add this difficulty setting in order to, for a player to be comfortable to play this game. So it is a necessity. Sometimes we kind of, we really want it, but uh, then uh, if you add, let's say, some setting that can, can, uh, that it can be sometimes detrimental to the game design. So um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of that case because it happened recently that I was thinking like, oh, okay, it would be a really nice dif uh, difficulty thing. But then I realized that it would just ruin the whole game feeling. So when you do this difficult settings, you have to kind of be careful, uh, be careful uh, what you allow player to change uh, in order to make it easier for themselves. So one of the cases actually, and, and you difficult, for instance, difficult setting that we had to make was that uh, uh, in uh, Pathfinder of the Rushes, we have a lot of monsters that kind of cast some kind of spell and uh, that player loses control of, uh, a, or the, of the whole group or maybe of a certain uh, party member for a significant amount of time. And the only thing that player can do in that case is actually to micromanage all the, uh, their party to, I don't know, take this one uh, companion, bring it to this room, take all the rest of the companions, bring to the rest of the room, just just them not to kill each other. So, and we argued actually uh, whether we're going to add this difficulty setting or not, because some people said like, guys, this is the effect of like not preparing for the battle or let's say having a low uh, skills etc um, and so on but some said yes but it's too punishing like yeah you it's, don't... A, it's a save load yeah scale. it's it's basically or you just have to just like oh my god i'm irritated now i have to wait i have to do some something that's not really a gameplay mm -hmm. uh per se so we've decided to add it anyway so yep yeah example yeah it's it's a it's a good point like i remember uh something that i really appreciate actually uh, fallout i think uh, does that very well and I, and and i fall into that fear as a designer as well like is uh, because I, I think it's cool in a game like fallout to take their example that you can actually go the wrong way you can mm -hmm. explore in an area that is way too strong for you and they they have this way specifically fallout one and two they had this way to make it very clear that you <laughs> Yeah, cool. You're here, but it's gonna be really, really hard. Like uh, they're, they're going to, uh, you know, uh, shoot at you in ways that it, there's absolutely no chance for you to win. But it, that, it did not feel frustrating, though, right? Whereas, mm -hmm. um, as a designer, sometimes I, with my current game, I'm feeling, oh, it's just hard enough. Uh, it's it's still possible enough that people might want to try that but it's frustrating because it's super hard so they're going to reload a million times and then they're going to complain this game is too hard but but i want them to understand that they're basically in the wrong area of the game right and uh, that's that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting point and we haven't fully solved it what do you think is the is the hardest for you uh when making an rpg mm, ah good question so in my experience uh we did an CRPG based on the uh, board game, like pre-existing basically a set of rules. So uh, the most difficult part was me to create, to design, to make the game within already pre-existing rules. Because as you said, uh, playing uh, with a real uh, dungeon master and playing with computers to different experiences. So uh, we didn't have that much uh, freedom that uh, dungeon masters uh, has and when uh, dungeon master can let's say adapt homebrew rules all the stuff. So we can't really do that that much. So for instance uh, the the trickiest part, I think, for me was when narrative designers uh, come to us and tell like, okay, we need one-to-one -one fight with this evil guy and i'm just like good 
how we're going to design it. Because a player can be a bot with like low strength, low, I don't know, uh, even charisma. It can be a very weird bot. It could be a fighter. It could be a wizard. So like, how do you balance one-to-one -one fight uh, in that case? And yeah, so I would say this was the trickiest part. Also, maybe I would say, mm, yeah, what, yeah, encounters are probably the trickiest part because you have to work not only with what you want as a game designer, but also what level designers want, what narrative designers want, like what kind of feeling this fight uh, should create, especially for the uh, story-based fights like because obviously we have just bosses for the sake of bosses and it was a, an interesting fight it just but it was just an encounter for the sake of battle but then you have uh, an important enemy <clears throat> big bad guy all this stuff so how do you kill it how do you design a fight how to, do you make it interesting for different types of players yeah i think that was well, there was a lot of actually difficult, but I remember this a lot. It happened a lot. Discussions happened a lot. Do you fear, as a, as a designer, do you fear that people are going to cheat your game and go around the problem in ways that makes it too easy? For example, uh, you know, they avoid the fight entirely. And like ah. this boss fight that you had designed is, you know, uh, is that something that you try to make sure that um, players get the challenge? Or do you think that it's actually... Uh, more possibilities to the player. Um, I don't fear that because I don't remember how many difficulty settings we have. Like uh, eight, eight, nine, yeah, something. Like we have, let's say around eight uh, different different difficulty settings, from the story to unfair, basically. Uh, but we, when we design the whole game and combat systems, we actually design for two settings, normal and core. Normal is basically uh, if you start uh, the game from scratch, that will be your pre-default uh, difficulty setting. And core is more is closer to the uh, Pathfinder rules uh, first edition. It's basically more like uh, board rules, tabletop one. So, and we have the story mode. Like, it's basically you just go through the whole story you just one shot uh, all the enemies you don't have any challenge whatsoever that's what i switch to when i <laughs> when my ass burns <laughs> yeah so uh we kind of embraced it it's part of um our game i would say you can even cheat more but uh, i usually cheat I kind of when I play some games I also can cheat because I can frustrate I just I don't have time I don't want to think I'm just tired okay let's turn on some uh, kind of cheats and uh, skip this encounter mm, I think that okay I got the idea of that encounter cool I love that I appreciate that yeah I just I'm don't just want to <laughs> waste another month <laughs> trying to yes. figure it out yeah I'm just <laughs> a bad player I, I accept this okay, let's move on so yeah, when uh, Pathfinder Kingmaker came out, uh, we had um, we had a conversation, we had a podcast with uh, Oleg Spilchevsky and Alex Michulin, the leaders of Alcat Games. Mm -hmm. It's just you know for our listeners, you can uh, find it by the link in the description. Um, and uh, well, they they made a point that uh, maybe. Uh, the, the gamers became a bit lazy because when that game came out, uh, it was a bit, you know, it was a bit of a mess. Uh, mm -hmm. It required a, a lot of patches to fix it, but still it was a brilliant game and after a couple of years it became even better. Uh, but at that point, uh, you know, uh, many players were uh, whining and complaining about the basic stuff. Uh, why am I attacking uh, a swarm of spiders and I cannot kill it? Well, because you are well not very smart person. You you cannot ha uh, harm a, a swarm of spiders with a sword. Uh, you should you know burn them with spells or and stuff like that. Well, and uh, my point is that Pathfinder is one of those RPGs when uh, where you. Uh, sometimes you have to use everything you got in your inventory, in your, I don't know, skill list to to succeed. Uh, what's your take on that? What's your take on the? What's your look at, uh, at the audience right now? Um, I don't think that the audience has changed significantly. It grew, so I would say it grew in both directions. So more of 
newcomers uh, in general and more of uh, hardcore uh, gamers. But uh, I, I wouldn't say that gamers in general became lazier. I would say that uh, we all grew up and now uh, we uh, like the generation of uh, gamers is just growing, 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 growing up. And a lot of us just don't have time. Like I don't have as much time as I had in uh, school, even in university. Uh, I just for me now to play a game is a little bit of a struggle. I just like I have to plan it ahead. I, 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 I just. I don't randomly just sit there and just like, okay, now I have eight hours. What am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to play that game. No, I just have to plan it ahead. Like on Saturday, from this to this time, I don't plan anything because I need to play some kind of game. I just want it. That's funny because uh, when I uh, when I was in school, I was playing Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 and Fallout. And Fallout was my favorite game. It was uh, easy to start and uh, easy to learn how to play it. Baldur's Gate and uh, all the other Infinity Engine games were a lot harder because, you know, you had to figure out the system. You had to understand what this uh, damage 2d6 meant. What the fuck is this? I mean, sword plus one. That's my, you know, that, that's, <laughs> yeah, I understand this. Exactly. Uh, and now, uh, I mean, uh, now I uh, had the patience to figure out the system and... Uh, I don't think that if I would try Pathfinder Kingmaker or Wrath of the Righteous in school, I would succeed in this game because I would be too lazy to understand it. So I don't think that this is the question of, you know, the the, the, the age of the gamer. It's, a, it's interesting because I think it's also related to, I mean, lazy, maybe, I think we get more and more comfortable, right? Like when we played games in the 80s, you would write, you, you would make your, you, you draw your map with, yeah. with, uh, <laughs> with a pen <laughs> and uh, uh, quests, you know, you would have to write down, go and talk to that person in that city so that, uh, but like there was no quest tracker, there was no markers for, first of all, there was no uh, journal where, you know, like right now, uh, the It's not even the, the 80s, the, the remember six, Morrowind. So, yeah, yeah, that's true, even in the 90s, right? And so now nobody would accept that. Like, you have to have markers, you have to have mini maps, you have to have everything, right? So, uh, yeah, we get more and more comfortable. I guess the same way, uh, uh, you know, you buy a car, uh, it is, it's unacceptable if it doesn't have the electric windows, you know? Well, actually, regarding no one would accept uh, that, I know that we, for instance, have people in the team who play immersive mode and they try to turn all, all off notifications, like no UI, you just play the game uh, and you kind of try to remember what you need to do, where you have to go. So it still depends, but I, I just remember some kind of uh, lecture, I think it was on UX uh, design or something like that, that uh, we are getting comfortable to different symbols. Let's say when you see a sit, uh, let's say a triangle and you know that it's most likely will mean play. Mm. So similarly with games, uh, you kind of get tr got trained that if you have a quest, you will definitely get a marker and you just start expecting that. Yeah. It's not necessarily about laziness, it's just you learn a, a certain pattern of behavior like if you talk with that guy uh, it will be everything important will be in your log, uh, in your journal or in the log you will get the quest marker you can activate a thing and m you can't even expect that it will kind of draw how you have to uh, how you need to get there or something like that so you are just trained to that if we will never introduce such mechanics such basically actually quality of life things whether they are detrimental to the game or not it will depend on the game we probably will still be we will not expect it and we're just like yeah fine i talked with that guy i wrote everything down now i have to figure out where is that how to get that mm -hmm. and whether i actually need to go there it's like playing dishonored without any markers I, like I, go explore the city and yeah. fi find the the person you need to find. I actually remember. Yeah, I mean, we we oh, did put the option, but uh, it's it's true that it's uh, you're talking about a, a small percentage of the population that actually enjoys that type of true. challenge. Most people they feel lost and they feel like you know I don't feel safe right now. I don't know what I have to do. I need to know. I remember the case. So um, I played uh, Cyberpunk uh, and um, initially, and I started as. Uh, uh, corpor uh, corporate 
and uh, I was taught like in the beginning it was kind of a tutorial that there is no choice uh, apart from what you can see because uh, you basically have to give uh, your USB stick or something like that uh, from your head this chip uh, to the guy and I didn't want to and I, I actually patiently sat there for five minutes just denying it and just like so what the game will you cannot ignore the, the telephone call that yeah. was i was so mad about it and i was just sitting there and waiting nothing happened so i i kind of learned that lesson mm -hmm. so everything you see is the only thing that you have and then there were two cases where i was kind of saddened uh, the first case was takimura so uh where uh you mm, takimura i think yeah was his name uh where you got ambushed uh, after you kidnapped uh, the uh, sister or something like that and uh, the journal just told you like you have to get out of there like don't and uh, Johnny told you don't save Takemura and because uh, and I know that some of my uh, colleagues kind of got the idea that you can't still save Takemura but I was kind of so conditioned that everything you see is everything you have that I even didn't doubt that Takemura is dead like there is there was no nothing in my uh journal uh johnny told me that he's dead like yeah probably he's dead yeah that's that's a weird story because uh at some point this game tells you that this is a linear adventure uh, because you know mainly in quests uh, as far as i played cyberpunk it was not uh, uh i wasn't you know i didn't finish the game i was disappointed for with some things i actually love the game still so. very beautiful uh very well designed but as an rpg not my cup of tea as they say and uh, at, uh, you know the, the next uh, thing this game says to you uh, I'm kind of like Deus Ex you can save Takemura even though the game says that he's dead and you are starting to you know you're being confused is, it, is that true are you wh when uh, is this game true to me yep now loading the house of the dead yeah. so yeah what I was to, about to um, ask you uh, Speaking of the uh, the players that feel lost and the immersive uh, mode and stuff like that You know even if you are an adventurer, I mean in, in real life you you travel a lot You don't come into a city trying to talk to every person that you see like in many RPGs you start uh, you know roaming about the map uh, Pointing uh, at the characters whichever got a name He's got a quest for me so how do you that's you know that's the old very old and very conservative logic how do you actually lead the player to uh you know to to explore the the location and feel organic about it um i i would say that in our game it's more or less kind of still old old style mm -hmm. but i actually remembered uh, the case of uh, skyrim and i don't remember was it markarth or something like that when you enter a city and immediately some kind of action is happening there's a you might save a person uh you might not save the person so there is a murder just in front of your eyes and you kind of have to talk with this like what happens like wh what was that like or if you manage to save i'm dovakin by the way uh, yeah yeah so uh, Here's my and card. that kind of how you can start all uh this uh, interactions in terms of natural uh behavior because there's something happened mm -hmm. uh, happens and you're just like oh, okay what happens Wh what is that yes mm -hmm. and also like uh obviously taverns or bars where you sit and uh, you just t uh, talk with a barman for instance it's something that quite common a lot of people do that just chit chat here and there but i don't think that uh, you will be able unless this is a specific goal of your game just to be natural about it i don't think that you will be able to escape this I would say assumptions or limitations of uh, this uh, game world because you still have to to make to player yeah. it, it's also have to be the player's agenda so the player have to do something like the player have to like choose to talk with you because if it will be all the time like uh, that npcs are coming to you and just like oh my god like help me or like i i can see you have a sword like uh, let's do this or that it will be that the world is pushing you and not that you are pushing the world and just exploring it uh do you think that the uh, this will ever going to change because uh one game that came to my mind uh, is um 
Kingdom Come Deliverance. Mm -hmm. It's got its flaws, but still there's that kind of simulation where you can be late to do something. Uh, you can, you know, postpone some quests and then you find out that, uh, you know, uh, a week has passed since you've got this quest. And of course, the person you were about to save died or disappeared or something. Uh, so about the... Uh, you know, I finished uh, I finished the latest uh, installment to Deus Ex uh, this year only. And it, um, I've caught that feeling that the game is kind of paused uh, until I do something. So, like, it's always sunny in Prague in the first act, and I do this and that. It, uh, it took me, like, three days to finish all the quests, and it's still sunny. So, um, I mean, the more I think that uh, you will agree or disagree, uh, be my guest, the more uh, immersive the game is in that terms, the better. Because, you know, we're trying to create something more than just uh, theme parks. Nope. Uh, um, let's say uh, from our experiences at Overcat. So in Pathfinder Kingmaker, we actually have this time limit, as mm -hmm. uh, we called it. So yeah. you also could be late to do something. Like if you don't do that, uh, the quest uh, might be failed. You might uh, get a lot of uh, these bonuses, a lot of stuff. So there were a lot of things that were time-based but they were not necessarily actually that harsh if you understood how the game works. There were some uh, problems with how we explain how to rest, because resting in uh, Pathfinder games takes a lot of time, like nine hours, and if it is a time-based thing, you don't want to spam resting. At least nine hours, sorry. So, and a lot of players actually didn't like it because uh, players like when game caters them so if i don't want to do it right now i don't want to do it right now like let the world stop and wait kind of thing so mm -hmm. in pathfinder of wrath of the righteous we decreased significantly amount of uh time limits we try to create this pressure and decision making uh, uh by the player based on the narrative let's say like you have this war going on so you kind of can't be lazy uh, and sometimes it actually contradicted the like you have this war you have to save people are dying especially like there was there is a dresden siege when you have to um take back uh the whole uh, citadel of Dresden, and in between you can rest for nine hours, like mm -hmm. a kind of just on the wall. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just, in the uh, middle of. Well, the, we kind of because we understood the weirdness of that situation. We tried to find some spots where we put a special, like you can rest here, because uh, that's I don't know, soldiers barrack or something mm -hmm. like that. So you can, s s s but still, it's kind of weird. Like yeah, there is dissonant. a siege. Yeah. So, but nine yeah. hours to sleep, it's, it's a, fine. <laughs> It's a bit classic though, right? Even in a dungeon crawler where you know that there's a big boss on the other side of this of this yeah, door, you just sleep just before him. But um, yeah, I mean, how much anxiety are you willing to give to the players before they mm -hmm. think it's too much? It's always interesting. What, what would you say was a, a moment in the development uh, where you felt very excited you felt like super proud like oh yes that's that's what our game is about you know something that you th you thought that's it we got it and silence <laughs> uh, i don't know I, I i think it's it's it wasn't like a one specific moment it's more like when uh, you read, I don't know, Reddit, uh, some forums where people discuss the game and you see that the player understood reference, the idea, like, or what I actually know, I actually know when I'm really excited. So uh, initially on the Pathfinder of the Righteous, I also started from creating uh, in-game items like weapons, equipment and so on and so forth. And I was, I always was very happy when I created some kind of item, I don't know. Uh, uh, with interesting mechanics but I didn't think any special of it it was some kind of item that had to be there because well we need to reward players but then players actually found a nice thing about it and then planned the whole bid let's say about uh, around this weapon and I was just like ah wow I, I didn't think about it so I really like when 
players actually give me some insights uh, in our game. They're like, oh, you can do that. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, you can kill this monster like that. That's quite creative. And I really like uh, when gamers uh, are really creative about the game and try to do something that was not initially planned. Mm -hmm. And when they succeeded it, I'm just like, yeah, 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 let's nerf that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, speaking about <laughs> these moments, uh, Raf asks you about, uh, wasn't it, uh, it that when you when you come to, to your office and uh, you're, you know, the, the leaders of the team go like, we're making a sequel? <laughs> um, well... Or, 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 or were you like, not again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I was, uh, uh, I, I don't know, for me it was just like, yeah, let's do it, like, because uh, uh, as I said, I joined uh, all cat team uh, on Pathfinder uh, Kingmaker as a junior game designer, so I had a little bit of understanding of D&D mechanics, not really about Pathfinder, so I had, and there is still difference between 3.5 and even Pathfinder 1st edition, I had to learn all those small uh, nuances and differences, so when we kind of created a second game uh, in the same setting, I was just like, okay, now I can kind of enhance my knowledge, use it a little bit better than uh, initially. So I was, I was happy, but yeah, it's just uh, after, I don't know, how long was it? Like three years uh, in development, two years in development, mm -hmm. uh, Rust of the Righteous. At the moment, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> uh, it was... 2nd of September, we released recently. <laughs> there was a lot of work. I need, to, I need time yeah. to relax. I have a question for both of you, actually. Um, I've noticed uh, that the two countries to me that are the most hardcore about RPGs and the most, uh, uh, you know, they love the, the, the depth uh, are Germany and Russia. And uh, do you do you know why is there something like culturally in Russia that is so uh, conducive to to love for depth and RPGs? Well, it's uh, it's a very complex question, and there can can be no easy answer. So, uh, <laughs> well, first of all, uh, the I think that the reason the main reason is that uh, Russia is mostly. PC Empire. Mm -hmm. We have mm -hmm. uh, more players playing on <laughs> personal computers than on consoles historically. Why is that? Well, that's the more you know <laughs> difficult part. So, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, there was there still was that country called the USSR, and when it fell, uh, there uh, it was followed by a lot of crises and uh, financial disasters and baby boom and uh, well we never had such companies as Firaxis or Apple or its software with with decades of history uh, but we still got our own enthusiasts who mm, built up the, the gaming culture uh, in Russia but they were pirates so um, but the, the the you know the the absurd of this is that the the piracy was the source of knowledge for the whole country and uh pcs were uh available at some institutes and universities uh, we did not know what you know amiga or commodore 64 were uh we started like from the 25th floor uh and um uh, we had markets that uh, you, where you could buy PC games for a price like less than 50 cents now. It was like 15 rubles for one disc with a compilation like 99 in one. And uh, so, yeah, it was... Uh, I'm actually writing an article about this. Uh, it's it's uh, an article for the CRPG book project. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, th this article is actually about the uh, one of the first Russian RPGs, Conan Legends of the North. But I have this uh, huge intro with, which is actually related to the uh, to the importance of this game. So yeah, it's it's the it's a very cultural and uh, you know political related question. So uh, yeah, Germany, Eastern Europe, uh, countries like Poland um, and uh, Russia, we are the you know the the PC empires. Consoles yeah, came later. 
consoles came later and uh, it was, uh, you know, it's cheaper to buy a console, but it's uh, expensive to buy games. So, you know, you had to balance between those. And uh, still, we uh, we have uh, more players playing on PCs right now, I think. Did you do any research on this? No. I mean, right? What, what's the picture right now? No, uh, we haven't done, but yeah, I would say more players doing PCs, but we still do. Obviously, take an example of Pathfinder, Rise of the Righteous, mm -hmm. or in general, Pathfinder, uh, we kind of have at our heart PC players obviously we think about the console players yeah. but because it is it is quite difficult to create a UI and UX that would fit both perfectly uh, PC and console especially if you're talking about such complex I would say games in terms of mechanics or all those uh, small details if uh, as for instance Pathfinder or a lot of strategy games yeah that's just not that kind of game yeah I mean in the uh like in 19 oh, I don't know 20 2006 2007 when Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 you know, came out there were games like Mass Effect or uh, even mm -hmm. earlier Knights of the Old Republic who significantly uh, that significantly changed the landscape of the genre because consoles took their place on the market so uh, basically, uh, when uh, Knights of the Old Republic released, we bought as a present to our uh, family friends uh, the Xbox and Knights of the Old Republic. And I had to play test that everything is running, everything is fine. So I started playing that game and I was just like, oh my god, what is that? That's not a CRPG, oh, sorry, not an RPG game. I, I couldn't understand how an RPG game could be in the console. Mm -hmm. Lays, uh, years later, I played Knights of the Old Republic on the PC and I was just like, oh my god, that was the, oh, oh, that how, ah, so it was a moment of realization. For me, it was a learning lesson. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a bit, I've got a, another question about the, you know, the, the role-playing game standards. Uh, I think that Raf can relate because in every classic traditional role-playing game there's that uh, thing called experience points. Mm -hmm. A very, you know, very old style of, I mean, when were experience points even invented? In like 1970s? I think and so, still, yeah. still you uh, and yeah, I mean, not just you. I mean, uh, the the developers of uh, role playing games still use this uh, as a, as a you know as an as a, what's the fucking word for it? Experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a trope. Uh, they still use it as a trope, and uh, but it's kind of. Um, conventional and uh, I mean in immersive sims uh, in games like prey you are totally uh, in this in the, on this space station when where people injected something in their head to become better and the the whole role-playing system the character um, system is totally explained by the setting it's itself but in games like Fallout 1 and 2 Baldur's Gate Playscape tournament whatever Pillars of Eternity, Pathfinder, you are still gaining experience points after uh, you get level up and you get some points to spend or your characteristics and shit. Uh, the question is why? The question that is, if is it ever going to change? Is it necessary, uh, necessary to change it? Uh, does it make any sense? Yeah, I got the question. Uh, I actually like uh, experience points uh, in general as idea. First of all, uh, you can, as a, a game designer, you can play around with them. You have quite a lot of freedom in terms of uh, what you want to do, how many, let's say, you can differentiate between monsters, quests, how many experience points they will give. You can kind of uh, approximate depending on how linear your game is you can even control uh, the pro uh, progress of your player so it, it is a really nice tool and it is really not easy to understand for the gamer so you basically have uh, this uh, coin I don't know, like experience meter. I don't know. That's mm -hmm. better. And it just like it fills in, fills in. Once it uh, filled in, you level up. You kind of progress as a character, uh, and then it starts in you. So it's something very understandable. Uh, but sometimes, for instance, in Wrath of the Righteous, we have 
uh, usual levels, like, I don't know, fighter levels, for instance, uh, <clears throat> player classes. And then we have Mythic Pass. Mm. So Mythic Pass, for instance, they don't depend on how many monsters you kill, they just... It actually... Uh, pinned to a certain moment in the narrative like you have to do a certain thing then uh, I've already got my first mythic class. Yeah, yeah so if something happens and you get your mythic level so uh, this is a different approach how you can also uh, level and uh, control your character uh, your player progression but uh, the second part, it, it's more like a narrative tool uh, just to ensure that uh, the player doesn't get something very important for the story too early or too late. But the first is more about the player and the way uh, they approach uh, the problem, the way they kill uh, monsters, let's say, the way uh, they, like, you can roll, uh, enroll, sorry, roll random encounters or in Fallout you can go and... Um, kill different monsters just to level up faster or level up uh, level up different skills. So I wouldn't say that uh, just because experience is something uh, of an old mechanic, it is bad. But I think that in the future, we will see more and more of different approaches, how to how do you progress the player, how whether we really need experience mechanic here or we don't. I think the, the deeper the system is and the more Mm, freedom uh, it has to give to the player like facilitate you have something like a common ground for instance in many uh, games you will have gold or some kind of money mm -hmm. to buy and sell in very rare game you will see a barter as a, a way to exchange uh, items i think was it atom i don't remember some kind of apocalypse uh, game had this more like of a barter system and it is an interesting mechanic, but it's a little bit, for instance, more complex for a person, for a player to understand, because uh, we don't use money or barter uh, every day. And experience is actually, I wouldn't say that obviously we don't have this experience. Sadly, we don't have this experience bar above our head. I would like to know my level, how good am I uh, as a, a professional. But would you? Yeah. yeah there, there's always a level <laughs> cap, so I don't think that you would. <laughs> Not always. Uh, in some games, there is a very, very high level cap, and probably I would die earlier than reach uh, the level cap. So <laughs> let's let's say not in this fight. The 20 is not too much. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we understand the idea of the progress. We understand the idea of the bar filling in and then something something happening. So, did you have any personal ideas of uh, you know breaking this tradition of uh, gaining experience points? Not for I mean not for the the, the hard uh, core game like Pathfinder or something uh, close to it, but. Mm, actually. Or, or don't you uh, even <laughs> see this as a problem? Uh, I don't see it. Oh, I think in actually, sorry, I just remembered in uh, some uh, our board RPGs, like tabletop RPGs game, we especially with more focus on role playing rather than uh, more like on the mechanic and battles. They have a lot of them don't really have experience per se. For instance, um, I don't remember the name of the the game in English. Uh, something about knives. I remember. So uh, an interesting mechanic there is that you go on a mission uh, and uh, when the mission ends, you have a checklist actually, like uh, whether you role played your character and uh, check, whether you did something useful, check, there is something, something else and else. And depending on how many checks you get, you get uh, your points then, uh, that you can then reassign and say, okay, I take this point and now I improve my, I don't know, uh, Agility, for instance, I take this point now. I, I improve my prowess, and so that on. That makes so sense. Yeah. So uh, actually, there are a lot, especially in the table, because uh, there's a lot of RPGs on the table board. One, I think much. I wouldn't say much more, but uh, it's easier to create a, a set of rules rather than to create a computer game. So uh, they actually experiment a lot with the idea of uh, the experience, like how do you level up, how do you progress uh, the player. So ob uh, in, obviously in CRPG in games we will see more and more of, uh, of that just because there will be more game designers, more creative people trying like, okay, I want to change it. What is my focus? So I would say it would 
would depend on what the focus of your game and how you make sure that the player get what you want uh, him or her to get. Like, what is the focus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, I mean, for me, uh, experience points have been... It's interesting because other than Ars Vitalis, I've always uh, started my game with experience points and I've always removed them at some point. Uh, the, the, I mean, experience points, they, they're, of course, they, they are easy to understand for players. They, they are, it's a bit of a game in the game. Like, every time you do something, bing, you know, it feels satisfying. But uh, in the case of the games that I've been working on, there was always that problem where if you give X points every time you kill someone, then you encourage killing, for example. And then how do how do you give X points on people that sneak mm -hmm. around? You know, uh, which is a problem. Then you say, well, we're gonna give X points on achieving goals and, and remove entirely all the other things like uh, you know the actions that don't really matter. It's all about the, the, the achieving goals. And then and then you have a little bit of that hardcore RPG legacy in there where you know i mean in our case we always replaced it by some sort of tokens like some sort of objects like you know the runes or the uh the, in the case of prey it was the the, the neuro mods uh and, and because it was more of an economy that was in game a little less abstracted and uh it, it felt better for the kind of you know the kind of games that uh we've been doing but then again are we really doing RPGs? You know, I've, I've, I, I'm not sure. Are we, you know, some of that is the topic. Like, what what defines an RPG uh, and a modern RPG specifically is is XP uh, necessary or you know, again, the RPG police would probably uh, give me a fine. You know, we and, are the uh, RPG so police here. Don't worry, Raph. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, as long as you don't send me to jail, I'm, I'll be fine. You're free uh, to go, sir. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting, but well, one other question I have actually, uh, because you were talking about the systems, and uh, you said something interesting. You said uh, it's easier to design a set of systems than designing a game. That, that's uh, you said that casually, but I thought it was a very interesting, um, interesting statement. You said um, that casually, but now you will pay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, I mean, no, it's a, it's actually a pretty good point, but uh, but it can also serve game creation to just design systems sometimes without exactly knowing where you're going and then like the systems will tell you where you're going in a way because they will often they will allow you to do some things what, what what's your process usually do you start with uh when when designing a game are you thinking more of do you start with the system do you start more with the story or like uh what, what is your what is the genesis of, of your thinking usually um, okay, so if we talk about, let's say, Pathfinder Wrath of Righteous, it was pretty easy and Kingmaker. The system was already there. So uh, uh, in terms of like what uh, game designers were dealing with is how you uh, take something uh, from the table, put it uh, in the uh, CRPG. Also, how do you uh, translate it to the player? And then we work with the narrative design a lot to ensure that uh, the narrative narrative and mechanics uh, don't contradict each other as much as possible because uh, they will always contradict uh, at some point but um, I would say just because we have our teams quite together and at the same time separate uh, we usually start it um, simultaneously so you kind of start with the setting uh, all the time and then you just uh, you kind of design different ideas and then you negotiate like okay narrative design want this level design would like uh this and that from uh the gameplay and we kind of think that this would be a cool feature so how do you fit everything together so i would say it is a simultaneous problem uh oh sorry uh process where we quite often discuss and then just change here and there so I wouldn't say that uh, it starts just with the narrative or just with the mechanics or level design. It's it's sort of we work together basically. 
sharing the ideas, like uh, especially in the kitchen, just drinking coffee, or what do you think about it? We would like to do like the narrative designs, like we would like to have this and just like, okay, can we do that? Uh, we can't, we can do that. Okay, what do you think about if we change it to this and that? So it, actually the lesson I really learned uh, in, in, I don't know, the last year and a half is that Commun communication is a key like mm -hmm. the more you communicate with the other uh, team members the better your game will be because what you will do you will actually understand the struggles of the other the people and you will be able yeah. to help them uh, either to maybe change their pipeline change their understanding of uh, the game or you will just oh, okay I know what they need to do how can I maybe change on my side uh, something So com communication so the, is the key. The kitchen thing, mm -hmm. uh, to that point, sorry to interrupt, but the kitchen thing is very interesting. You, you, you said, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we go to the kitchen and then we, we, uh, we realize that someone has a need for an idea or whatever, we're just talking casually. Uh, how do you do the kitchen now? Because I, I assume <laughs> uh, Russia has been the same, you know, in the same system that, as we have, which is everybody's working remotely, which is super, I mean, there's some good things about it, but there's also some things that are not so good about it. And, and, and including the absence of the, of the kitchen uh, thing now, right? Uh, actually, good question. Uh, to some degree, the creati the kitchen creativity, let's call it like this, uh, has decreased uh, significantly. But at the same time, we uh, set up a really nice um, online working environment. So we have, uh, for instance, I can see pretty much everything that narrative designers uh, discuss in the open space like well or the level designers so i know what they are talking about what maybe their struggles and i can just uh catch the oh wait 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 we have the different understanding of, of uh, what is happening and uh in general uh during uh, this um this period of time i try to communicate with the team members as much as possible uh in term, even just uh, directly sending like oh how are you what you're doing like okay i have this task let's discuss it please so uh i would say it changed a little bit and uh, probably we will come back to office uh we will start going to the office more often once uh the new project uh, or something like that will kick off where we would need this creativity brewing and uh going on but at the moment it is we kind of solve more or less uh, something that was already uh decided on so it's more like minor changes so there's a new project on the way one day yes Obviously, I saw that you're hiring. I saw that you're hiring. We're always hiring. I saw that you are hiring for a new project. Okay, <laughs> let's put it like this. Okay. You don't fool me. So, uh, the last thing about RPGs and what defines an RPG I wanted to talk about, we discussed it with uh, Ken Levin. Uh, it's dialogues. Well, I, I mean, Pathfinder has wonderful dialogues. But still, it's the, you know, it's, it's choosing from the list of uh, prescripted phrases. And even, even though I can uh, do uh, a massacre, I can start a massacre anywhere in the game, it's still uh, prescripted dialogues which are, uh, you know, defined by my character's stats. And I know that I can, uh, you know, uh, turn off the, those uh, tips. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but what's your take on dialogues and the future of dialogues? Uh, because there are many RPGs with different kind of dialogues. When you, I mean, like games like Gothic. When mm -hmm. I think that Gothic One started this, uh, the thing that later uh, Deus Ex, uh, Human Revolution, and Mankind Divided. Uh, hopped on and uh, Mass Effect earlier, earlier on uh, when you choose the uh, the first phrase which defines the uh, you know the the tone and then you see that two characters are just having a conversation and you don't know where it will lead them. So, what's your take on the dialogues as a, as a, you know as a form of work? Um. For me, this is like two different approaches, obviously. Uh, and I prefer our approach because I really love uh, when I know 
what my exactly, character is going to uh, to say. I kind of got used to it in mass, uh, got used to it in Mass Effect, so I was just like, okay, I, I got the general idea. Because, but actually, even in Mass Effect, for instance, if we take it, uh, you have in most cases just three choices, but the narrative is more or less, was pretty much the same. So uh, what they did is that uh, they allow you to play a different character within a certain uh, narrative, I would, uh, I would mm-hmm. say. You, there were obvious uh, some points where you make a, uh, an important decision, should be at least, if I'm remembering Mass Effect 3 ending. Ah, oh, it hurted. Uh, it hurt. Uh, so, yes, and uh, but still it is, it's kind of my character, but I'm. Sh- uh, it's more like 50-50. It's half of my character, half of uh, the narrative uh, designer character. Uh, if you allow for more uh, sentences, and I will be honest with you, I don't like to read. So for me, it's very <laughs> difficult to, uh, to read uh, that many sentences, the, all this uh, narrative uh, stuff. But what I really love about it, that in the end, I have an uh, option of like from three to sometimes eight, ten different uh, answers. And I just like... Even if it will result in more or less the same uh, answer from uh, the NPC, I just like I like this flavor a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Like I want to be the a little bit more, flavor, yeah. yeah, chaotic. I want to be a little bit more uh, lawful. And as a player, I want to be in control of what am I talking about. So, uh, and I think uh, both systems are great for uh, what they do because obviously they solve a little bit different uh, problems and both of them actually give you enough freedom to feel that to feel this connection with uh, the uh, character on your screen uh, and also don't uh, forget that then there is a, a whole uh, procedurally generated uh, narrative uh, things uh, which are very interesting and hopefully it will also grow faster and faster because I'm actually looking forward to what procedural uh, generation will allow us to do with the narration uh, in future because current uh, situation is quite promising I would say and I think uh, there is a big potential and but at the same time uh, it is it would be a separate system so both of them it wouldn't be like the procedural gen, uh, generated uh, narrative would uh, replace, yeah. replace mm-hmm. yes uh, already written one it will be just a different type of uh, game and mm-hmm. uh, disca- dialogues yep Raf, can you relate? I, i'm yeah to some to some level i see what you're saying about the the player expression and the need to uh the flavor part um however uh in dialogue personally i've always been very uh so i'm like you i don't like to read uh and at the same time i put a lot of value on things that have some sort of consequence some sort of impact on my experience so as soon as i detect as a player as soon as i detect that there's no um meaning to to my choices then it bothers me a little bit and that was my biggest grief with uh, cyberpunk right cyberpunk where you, you i realized pretty quickly maybe uh, an hour into into the game that none of what i could say would ever have any impact like even accepting a quest or, or not accepting a quest there was no choice like the thing is like so are you gonna do this uh no and then it, and then you would go mm-hmm. to ah oh, come on do it and then you have, well, I, I guess so then, or maybe yes, or yes, I will. And, but either way, I would go to the to do the quest, right? So uh, I, I thought, well, they kind of overdid the flavor, the meaningless flavor part, because uh, it would be a different thing if if then there would be some sort of a count in in the background of like trying to like shape my how much of an asshole I am, or how much of a nice person I am, or how much you know uh, lawful I am, etc. And then have some sort of consequence later, but I, I quickly sniffed that there was none of that, um, and it was just pure mm-hmm. player expression for no reason other than just let the player express what they want. Um, so ideally, in my world, uh, either either I, I would only have dialogue that actually, you know, I, I would I wouldn't have the flavor because if it's meaningless, or if I have a lot of dialogue choices, then it means something. Then, you know, the NPCs are going to respond and not only respond in flavor, but also like in their actions later. Like they will like me a little more or something. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's my, uh, that's my dickiness. 
So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for thank joining you. us. Uh, thanks, Raf. Uh, I hope you will have a great show tonight. Thank you. Yeah, it was nice Bye. talking to you guys. Bye.